this video, my cult indoctrination part two, I'm going to tell you about how I was indoctrinated and the effects of the indoctrination growing up in the religious cult. And also we'll define what indoctrination is. Now in the first video, uh, my cult indoctrination part one, I used some extremely graphic language. I likened my perspective to being indoctrinated as being soul raped and buggered in my soul. And I did not mean to cause any offence to anyone, but, and I hope I didn't, but to find out a problem, you have to get right down to where the root of it is. There's a saying that says, if we can make the correct diagnosis, the healing can begin. And so in the three years that I've been doing the Cult Escape campaign, I've been looking to define exactly what the situation is and has been and was for my own life so that we can get down to what's really going on and people can be helped. So I'm going to quote again from uh, the book Cult Escape that I wrote, and it's uh, going to uh, examine the indoctrination in the light of my own experience. Um, what indoctrination is, first of all, what indoctrination is, here's a good definition. It means instilling a set of beliefs in someone in such a way that they are unwilling or unable to question or evaluate those beliefs independently. To put another way, in effect, indoctrinated people are disabled from critical thinking and analysis. That's how cults indoctrinate people. And so here we go. Um, this is the, uh, these are some of the laws and, that I was brought up to believe in. I was indoctrinated into believing in. I went to 11 meetings a week, 10 latterly, and I heard this rhetoric and this teaching uh, continuously. Uh, here's uh, seven of them. Number one, separation from evil was God's principle of unity as defined by the man of God's latest version of evil. So separation from evil was down to what the man of God's latest, the, the rules and laws about what was evil. So, for example, at, at, there was a time when it was OK to have a, uh, have a moustache and a beard. The, the men of God of the past used to and then it became banned. There was a time when you could live in any house and then only detached houses. You could have a house with shared drains and then you they were banned. They became evil. Uh, there were, you, could have a, you were not allowed to have a mobile phone, computers, and then they were allowed. And so um, these are all things which we were indoctrinated about, about what the definition of evil was according to the man of God. And it changed all the time. Another one, the man of God was the universal leader, the leader of the recovery of the truth, the elect vessel, the spiritual descendant of Paul the Apostle, and whatever he said is what God was saying. That's what we were absolutely indoctrinated into believing. Also, when people violated the will of the man of God, it was a good thing that they were cut off for life if necessary because they were unclean like a leper. I remember crossing the road to the other side after seeing somebody who had been withdrawn from the night before, a family friend, because he was now unclean in my eyes. We alone had the truth. We certainly didn't know anyone else who did. We were right, as all cults are, of course. The man of God's interpretation of the Bible were the right ones. All other interpretations were wrong. And whenever the man of God introduced a new law or rule, even one that contradicted the previous laws, it was always justified because we were told that God has turned a corner. And so therefore, it didn't, it didn't matter whatever the, uh, the man of God said, it was all, always justified by God turning a corner. Now, as a result of this indoctrination, I grew up thinking and believing in a certain way. My mind was bent in a certain way. And if you have never been in a cult before, imagine if you had a child who was indoctrinated by a group of religious people who had these beliefs as a result of it. My four grandparents, two uncles and aunts and 10 cousins were unclean, wicked and of the devil. And it would be totally wrong to have any contact with them. This was because from around 1970, when I was four years old, these relatives were withdrawn from and therefore completely cut off and were not allowed, we were not allowed to have any more contact with them whatsoever. 
Also, uh, attending 11 meetings, latterly 10 a week, was essential to maintain obedience to what the man of God expected us all to do. Sharing a meal with literally anyone who wasn't an exclusive brethren member, even a cup of tea with a neighbour who was ill, was a wicked sin. Anyone who wasn't an exclusive brethren member was worldly, unclean, ignorant, wrong, unrighteous, disobedient, not worthy of our fellowship, amongst many other things. This is what I was indoctrinated into believing. Houses that had shared drains or adjoining walls were of the world and were not separate. Televisions were a pipeline of filth. And to, and to even physically touch one was a sinful act. I once, I touched them many times in shops watching sports on a Saturday when I'd sneak off. And I eventually was forced, cajoled into confessing it, confessing my sin. Computers, mobile phones, radios, recorded music was all evil and worldly. Cinemas, theatres, sporting events, or any entertainment was of the world and absolutely worldly. Owning a pet was worldly and took away our affection from God and many were put down the next day when that law changed. Fun fairs, theme parks, circuses were worldly and all people going to these places were deceived. Joining trade unions, any unions, or having a job where you must sign a secrecy act was evil as it meant having a link with the world. During, doing jury service was to share in making a judgment with the world and was forbidden. Men having sideburns and moustaches or hair that wasn't short was worldly. And women who wore makeup or jewellery, wore trousers or dyed or cut their hair short were worldly. These are things which affected my life, as you can imagine. It made me very, very of them and us situation whereby we were not, we were so separate from these, from these wicked people. We looked down upon them. It made us elite. Many, many other effects it had on us, which I can, looking back, I can see were very, very detrimental. It was like a bonsai tree with the roots being snipped. I was immersed daily in an environment of these beliefs. 11 meetings a week forged the neural pathways in my mind so deep that I grew up a clone to the dictates of the leader. I believe I was literally disabled from critical thinking and analysis. There was only one thought, one truth, and that was we were right. This attitude and false identity form crusts of layers of internal fear, of ever stepping over the line confusion as to who I really was, paranoia about the possibility I might go to hell, and the deep dread of ever being separated from my family. This was all indoctrination that I received. Apart from the hellfire indoctrination, I rate the worst of these as being the harsh, judgmental, despising and looking down on people who weren't in the truth like we were. I remember our neighbours two doors away who we learned were Catholics. I remember having feelings of hatred in my heart against these stinky Catholics who didn't have the truth that we did. I was about five years old. Sorry Catholics, I love you. And looking back now, I'm just amazed how screwed up I was by this indoctrination. And so, it's about creating awareness. It's about letting people know that you don't have to be controlled by the will of another, by a man and a group who tell you they are right. There's 40,000 denominations, religions around the world, all claiming to be right. If this is helpful or you can relate to it, please leave a comment, like and subscribe. Uh, buy the book Cult Escape if you wish. And this is the whole, there's a chapter on devoted to indoctrination in here, chapter 16. And um, if there's any uh, video you'd like me to talk about or you, maybe you'd like to uh, join me with a video and we'll do a duo, get in touch and I'll see you soon.